space is a great mystery to most of us, but much less so to Dr. Maslin Othman. Malaysia's first astrophysicist has dedicated her life to finding out more about the universe, along the way setting up important education tools like this, the Kuala Lumpur Planetarium. Dr. Maslin is also a graduate of the University of Otago. She's led her country's National Space Agency and for almost a decade, she was the director of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. Now she's back in Kuala Lumpur, heading an ambitious project aimed at transforming her country into a leading global player in science and innovation by 2050. Dr. Maslin, it's a great privilege to meet you. You were the first woman to study physics uh, and get a doctorate in it at Otago University and then you came back to Malaysia where you were your country's first astrophysicist. What's it been like to be such a pioneer? It's been a very uh, hard road uh, because I had to start everything from scratch. Uh, there was uh, no um, set solutions. Um, no path uh, to come to where I am today. You were studying physics in the 1970s at Otago mm. University. Why did you go to New Zealand to study? Well, uh, it's because I was offered a Colombo Plan scholarship and it meant having to go to either Australia or New Zealand. And I'm glad that the Colombo Plan brought me to New Zealand. You were a Muslim woman in a country a long way from your home, mm, uh, mm. surrounded by almost entirely other male students and yes. professors. What was that experience like? I didn't think of myself as a female, usually, you know, because I always look out and not in. Um, and so always looking out, uh, what was that physics problem? What was the project I had to do? Uh, so I never thought, oh, I'm a female, therefore I cannot do this project or I cannot uh, go to this place. Um, so by being always outward looking, I never felt I had a problem being a female. Was there anything about the New Zealand approach to education that especially resonated with you at that time? I felt that the, um, the education system itself was focused on going deep into your fields, uh, a lot of lab work, which I enjoyed uh, very much. But I also loved, particularly loved, the egalitarian environment of the university itself. And that, of course, uh, was part of the bigger, of the larger New Zealand society, which was egalitarian. And I love the fact that the cleaner in the physics department held as much power as the chairman of the department. And in fact, in where it mattered, like in the sitting room, for instance, um, she had more power than the chairman of the, uh, of the department. So I, I love that about New Zealand as a whole, being egalitarian uh, society. That was very different to what you were used to here. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Are you still in touch with people that you studied with and knew at that time? Uh, some. Um, but they've all gone all over the world. My PhD mates, some are in Europe, in Australia, so not many stayed behind in, in New Zealand. And did you ever go back to the country? Yeah, I did. I went back three times. One, because a very, very close friend, the first time a very, very close friend of mine was uh, dying of cancer. The second time, to send my son for school. I insisted on sending him to New Zealand uh, for schooling because I wanted him to maintain to get a feel of what New Zealand is like because he was born in New Zealand. And the third time was I was on the way to Antarctica. And it, it was, uh, you know, nice to drop by uh, in Dunedin uh, on the way to Antarctica. Going back to your own schooling mm. here in Malaysia, when did you decide that you wanted to be a space scientist and uh, were you particularly interested in science at school, for example? I went into science when I was 15, um, fell in love with physics and fell in love with the rest of science uh, later on. But more than anything, I wanted to do physics. But I didn't uh, discover uh, astronomy, nor did I discover astrophysics until I went to New Zealand, um, Otago University, because at that time, uh, there were not many books, and nobody was really interested in astronomy or astrophysics here in, in the country. 
but it was different uh, in New Zealand. And what about your early childhood and your schooling then? What, uh, you, did you know much about space then? Or no, science? not at all. Not even science. No. Uh, remember, I, I went to school in the late 50s, uh, in my primary school, and I went to secondary school in the in 60s. So no, there wasn't much going on in space. And Neil Armstrong landing on the moon was uh, a very significant event. But I didn't think when I was listening to uh, the telecast of his landing on the moon that I would be, I would have space as a career. I, I never thought of it, not in a million years at that time. You did make space your career. You yes. uh, became an astrophysicist. You uh, yes. introduced uh, space sciences into the mm -hmm. Malaysian school curriculum. Mm -hmm. You advised the prime minister on space issues. And then mm -hmm. you landed quite possibly what sounds like the coolest job in the world, which was the <laughs> director of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. Yes, what yes. does a job like that involve? Actually, very little science. But by this time I had done, you know, I wasn't doing any more science. Uh, I had given up space research to set up the planetarium. So on a day-to-day -day basis, it was mainly diplomacy and uh, politics, actually. Um, how to balance uh, one country's uh, requirements versus another country's requirements. Sometimes they have synergy and sometimes they are, you know, uh, on the opposite ends. And it means usually, and this is of course the United Nations, bringing people to the same table uh, to talk. Even if they're not coming with uh, one agreement, um, we can agree on how to proceed. And that was my job on a day-to-day -day basis. But also the other part of the job is to see how we could use space um, to enhance the development of developing countries, especially this science and technology development. A hundred years from now, how much more do you think we'll know about space than we do at the moment? A lot more. We would have found uh, life in space somewhere. Of course, the nearest is, is Mars. And we would probably have a colony on the moon. The people on the street can dream about visiting outer space for sure. Uh, because as you know, Virgin Galactic is already going to be launching uh, aeroplanes uh, to space. So holidays on the moon in a hundred years, possibly holidays on Mars. Dr. Maslin, thank you so much for talking to us. It's been wonderful to hear yeah, from you. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much.